sein oder nicht sein? Und was ist die Frage? Es ist edle von dem Miet vertrockenen Spiel des Schleiderstehenden Pfeil von Boys und Maseln oder sich bewaffen in Ankegenjahren von Leid und endigen den Kampf. Hamlet. <lacht> Von wann entstammt der Mischbache? Mein Mischbache kommt von um, Russland, von Ukraine, ein Städtel, das ist gewählt, um, Zaslav. Meine Mutter was brought out across the border into Poland under the hay, and hay was snuck across the border. She and her mother, I guess. And my father snuck across the border on foot, someplace that was not patrolled carefully. So he walked across the border into Poland to get out of Russia. We went to Boston, and there he re-met my mother, who he knew from Zaslav, and that's where they were married. We lived in a, a very interesting uh, neighborhood. It was called the West End. It was about 60% Italian, and about 30, 25 or 30% Jewish, Yiddish-speaking Jews. The Italians spoke Yiddish, the Jews spoke Italian, some did. My friends were all a mix of Jews and Italians. We lived. Second floor was Italian, third floor was, was Jewish. And you could tell who the occupants were by the smell of the food. There's only one exact mention in, um, in the apartment. Mein uh, Baba Zeta, mein Tata Mama, and ich bin mein Bruder. My Baba was uh, nine more gallant English. She could bake a challah that was beautiful. They made a brush from uh, turkey feathers, these big feathers that they dipped in the, um, in the egg batter and, and basted the, the challah with that. And she taught my mother how to do it. I remember that vividly. It came out golden brown. It was so beautiful. The challah was beautiful. My father's barber shop was within, I would say, 75 yards of where we lived. It was nicely outfitted. There were three chairs, although I don't ever remember the third chair being used. And maybe it was just in case business got so so big that they would need a third barber. There was always a pinochle game going in the back room. When things got slow, that you could go in the back room and get in a card game. A little bit of gambling going on. My memory was that my dad had a reputation for being a pretty good card player. Haircuts, I think, were 25 cents. And a shave was a dime. And then I think by the time I left Boston, he was all the way up to 75 cents for a haircut. And a shave was probably a quarter. It was that kind of a, a business. This is a photograph of the grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather, my mother's father, Sam Spinner. You know, he believed in trying and going and doing. And there were often situations where I would declare some interest in something or other, and my parents would say, no, 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 he'd say, go do it. Just go do it. Here, here's a dollar, go do it. You know? <laughs> and, he was uh, quietly supportive because he admired that sense of try, try something, try something, go out and do it. My mom and dad were extremely careful people. Everything they did was, was colored by fear. What could happen if you do this or that? So be safe, just be safe. They, they didn't understand what Star Trek was all about. They just didn't get it. Which I understood. It's not their cup of tea that they don't understand about science fiction, that whole milieu. What they knew was that I was making a good living. I was a, a success. They knew that. Kids would come around to my father's barbershop and ask for a Spock haircut. And he had a picture of me as Spock hanging on a mirror. So he, could, he gave them a bang cut. You know. Spock is an alien wherever he is because he's not Vulcan and he's not human, he's half and half. He's a half-breed, what we used to call a half-breed, a mixed breed. Vulcan father, human mother. So he's not totally at home in the Vulcan culture, not totally accepted in the Vulcan culture because he's not totally Vulcan, certainly not totally accepted in the human culture because he's, he's part Vulcan. And that alienation was something that I had learned in Boston. I knew what it meant to be a member of a, of a minority, and in some cases, an outcast minority. So I understood that. I, I understood that aspect of the character, and I think it was helpful in playing it.
a song that burned itself into my brain, and I've, I just fell in love with this song because I felt so identified with it. A song called Often Weg steht der Boy. It spoke of a boy who says to his mother, there's this tree on the road, and all the all the birds have flown away from the tree. The tree is standing alone, and there's a storm coming. So I said to Mama, I said to my mother, look, Mama, instant say, Bada Fuegelver, and in a moment I want to become a bird, and I want to go fly to that tree and sit on its branches and sing to it to keep it company during the winter. And she says, Itzikroin, Nemem Gottes will, Nem Hoshmita Shalit is Oskmashwakil, the Kalosh Nem Dermit, get a sharper winter, in the Kishmit Hiderun, Weyes Mir and Windmer, in this winter label Nem, Tiasun the Shoite, Oig the Witz the Janking Gas, which Nalatoite. And then he says, Heb the Fliegels is Mishwer, so viel, so viel Sachen, and the Mamma Ungatun, the Fegel and Schwachen. I can't fly. My mother put on too many clothes. I so identified with it. I got away, but uh, it was tough. It was really tough. I remember my mother crying at the train station when I left, and. Uh, I was like my grandfather, and I was the adventurer, taking off for another world, for all they knew, and to be an actor. No way that that was going to work. <laughs> Isaiah approached me once at, a, at an event and introduced himself and said, we do a series of short story readings called Selected Shorts. Actors and actresses come and read short stories for us. Would you be interested? And I said, I, I would be interested in doing that. We became friends, and I, I did several of these short story readings for him. Isaiah had a background very similar to mine. He acted in Yiddish theater, and he knew Schwartz, and he had been in that whole milieu. So whenever I would work with him to do one of these short story readings, we would eventually lap it, lapse into Yiddish. And I would give him a little Shakespeare in Yiddish, and he would give me a little of this or that, or whatever. And, and we enjoyed each other with our Yiddish connection. Isaiah's gone, he passed away a year ago. And uh, I spoke at his memorial and talked about this Yiddish connection that I had with him. I found a, uh, a woman here in Los Angeles who was a psychiatrist, but who was a master of the Yiddish language. And I went to her and spent an hour every week or two, paid for the a psychiatric fee to have somebody to speak to in Yiddish. <laughs> and, um, and to help me with, with questions about the language, you know, because I missed it. But I think it's, it's going to be, it's just going to go away. It's going to become a historical reference fact, not something that's in the culture. Alive. You know, I don't see it being a, an alive language. I don't, I don't know where's, who's going to speak it, you know. How do you feel about that? Sad. Sad. That's the mama lotion. Very sad, sure. Are there any sayings that you remember from your grandparents? Yiddish any what? Say Yiddish sayings. There's Hindus in front of Yura. There's also no vax and viat sibyla. Bitten kop and red and the feast of if. Gay clubs of thin kop and vont. Go bang your head against the wall. When you say, I'm bored, I got nothing to do. Terrible stuff. Hakmanish Kinchainik, don't bang me a tea kettle. <laughs> those, those are the expressions I remember. Oh, my grandmother. Often from here, I go, I rebunish alarm. I rebunish alarm. Tell me, oh God, where are things going? <laughs> Master of the universe, tell me what's going on here. <laughs>